Auschwitz. There are few places on Earth that conjure up more images of death, horror, and pure agony than the Nazis' most infamous concentration camp. Here's what no one ever told you about it. A Polish cavalry officer named Witold Palecki walked into a crowd of people in Warsaw. They were being rounded up by German officers in preparation to be sent to Auschwitz, and he went voluntarily as part of the resistance. He smuggled out a series of reports on what was really going on inside the camp. Documents made their way to the outside world in 1940, 1941, and 1942, and after his escape in 1943, he wrote more. The result is an eyewitness account of the horror, starting with the public execution of some of the camp's Polish prisoners, who were sometimes shot and sometimes left to the elements. Later, Polecki saw the focus shift to Jewish prisoners, writing, Over a thousand a day from the new transports were gassed. The corpses were burnt in the new crematoria. While fighting typhus and surviving beatings, Polecki organized a resistance network within the camp, in addition to sending messages. The first message read, Bomb Auschwitz. Polecki escaped in 1943 and lived to see the end of the war and the liberation of the camp, but his commitment to the idea of a free and independent Poland was seen as problematic. In 1947, he was arrested by the communist leadership, tortured, and declared an enemy of the state. He was executed the following year. According to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, around 23,000 Roma were sent to Auschwitz, and 21,000 died there, but they were also part of an insanely brave rebellion. Most Roma were held in a section of Auschwitz called Zagoinalanger, a sort of holding center for entire families. It was established in 1942, and in 1944, it was decided that everyone in the camp was going to be executed for the simple reason that the space was needed for more prisoners. At the time, there were around 6,000 Roma there. One day, after they were warned that their executions were imminent, around 600 armed themselves with hammers and shovels, barricaded themselves in their barracks, and told the Nazis that if they wanted to take them to the gas chambers, they'd better come in and get them. The date was May 16, 1944. And here's the incredible thing. According to the Council of Europe, they sort of won at least temporarily. No one died that day, as had been planned. Instead, half the Roma prisoners were transferred to other camps. For the remaining half, the respite was merely a stay of execution. They were sent to the gas chambers a few months later. May 16th is now remembered as Romani Resistance Day for their attempts to stop the Nazis. The Zonderkommando were selected from amongst the healthiest men who were sent to Auschwitz. Some were promised their own survival, while others were told they could protect their families by working for the Nazis. They discovered very quickly that neither promise would be kept. Zonder Commando were selected because of their strength. Part of their job was to lie to prisoners so they would stay calm while they escorted them to gas chambers. Afterwards, they removed the bodies. They would sort through clothes, collect valuables, extract any gold teeth, and carry the dead to the crematorium. Then, when the ashes began to pile up, they shoveled it into a nearby river. Every few months, the Zonder Commando would be executed and new prisoners took their place. By the time this had happened a few times, people knew what they were in for, so the 12th Zonder Commando decided to take some Nazis with them. Prisoners Rosa Rabada and sisters Esther and Hanka Weitzblum worked at a munitions factory where they, along with some co-conspirators, started smuggling gunpowder to the Zonder Commando. They used this gunpowder and manufactured little uh, hand grenades. On October 7, 1944, Polish prisoners in Crematorium 1 grabbed a particularly sadistic guard and stuffed him in an oven. The workers at the other three crematoriums soon joined in. The gunpowder was taken to Crematorium 4. There, in a suicide mission, the Zadar Commando detonated the ovens. The crematorium would never be used again. When the Nazis regained control of the situation, 200 Zonder Commando were immediately executed. Their bodies were disposed of by the 13th Zonder Commando. The women involved were discovered and tortured, but never gave up the names of living conspirators. They were hanged on January 5, 1945. But they were instrumental in saving tens of thousands of Jews who would have been gassed and burned in crematorium number four. Whenever new prisoners arrived at Auschwitz, Dr. Joseph Mengele was on the train platform waiting and watching. Among the things he was looking for were identical twins. He demanded to know from my mother if we were twins. And my mother didn't know what to say. She asked if that was good. Records indicate that Mengele experimented on 732 pairs of twins at Auschwitz, although some estimates place the number at around 1,500. Some of his subjects survived, and many later gave testimony about what was done to them. And it's pretty horrible. Some twins remembered being given injections that were supposed to change a person's eye color, while others were deliberately infected with a variety of diseases and substances. 
twins would be measured and documented, their reactions, sometimes, to things like surgery without anesthetic and forced sterilization would be recorded. Often, one twin would be used as a control subject while the other was experimented on. When that twin died, the other was killed and they were both autopsied, all with one goal in mind, to find new ways to advance the development of Hitler's master race. You'll make twins with German women? That's the goal. Even though the only doctor you may have heard of was Joseph Mengele, he wasn't the only one performing medical experiments at Auschwitz. Karl Klauberg was working alongside Mengele in the area known as Block 10, and he was interested in finding an efficient way to sterilize large groups of people. Block 10's main purpose was a secondary genocide, or in other words, killing the unborn. Among his methods was a non-surgical procedure that introduced chemical irritants into the female reproductive organs. The inflammation it triggered caused swelling and sterility, and also caused quite a bit of death. Dr. Horst Schumann was working on the same project, only his methods involved exposing patients to x-rays in order to try and find just the right amount of radiation to sterilize without burning. This technique was deemed unsatisfactory, as there were too many casualties. Dr. Johann Paul Kramer was starving prisoners to see what happened as people wasted away and Dr. August Hirt took the opportunity to collect Jewish skeletons in the hopes of taking measurements that would confirm Jewish individuals were biologically different and therefore inferior to Aryans. Block 11 was a punishment block reserved for prisoners suspected of things like sabotage. Prisoners caught trying to escape were condemned to death by starvation and sent here to die in the aptly named dark cells. There were also so-called standing cells with floor space of less than a square meter where air entered through a single five centimeter square vent. As many as four prisoners at a time would be locked in that small space. Some were sent there for weeks at a time, usually just at night though, as they were required to work during the day. Block 11 was right next to Block 10, and they made up another infamous portion of Auschwitz, a place known as the Death Wall. Flogging was done in the courtyard. Prisoners were executed against the wall. Freddie Hirsch could have escaped. His mother, brother, and stepfather headed to Bolivia after Hitler's rise to power. He stayed behind in Germany and then ended up in Czechoslovakia, and it was there that he began his life's work, saving children. Hirsch was charming, and he used his personality to keep the Nazi guards at bay and keep his focus on the children. At first, he worked with the children in Jewish ghettos. He made sure that they had personal hygiene items and that they continued their education and got daily exercise. In 1943, he was caught facilitating communication between Jewish children and Terezin in the outside world. He was sent to Auschwitz. Once there, he established the children's blocks, where kids would spend their days before returning to their parents in the barracks at night. In secret, he oversaw their continuing education and arranged for life-saving measures. Because of Hirsch, roll call was done indoors instead of outside in the rain and snow, and he secured a steady supply of extra food. Packages that came into the camp addressed to people who were already dead were redirected to the children. By the beginning of 1944, he was caring for hundreds. This also coincided with his six-month anniversary at Auschwitz. Prisoners chosen for special treatment would be eliminated after six months. Hirsch had a few choices. Join Auschwitz's underground resistance, lead a revolt, or try and escape. They gave him an hour to decide. When the hour was up, his body was discovered. No one is sure what happened to him. He either took his own life or a Jewish doctor facilitated his passing. Before his death, he appointed two successors to make sure his work protecting the children of Auschwitz continued. It's well known that concentration camp prisoners who were healthy enough to work were forced to do so, but it wasn't until fairly recently that another part of the Nazis' forced labor scheme came to light, Heinrich Himmler's reward plan. According to the Ravensbrück Center, Himmler decided female prisoners could be turned into sex workers. There were a few things likely at play here. For one, Himmler believed he could prevent homosexuality by making women available. And secondly, according to Reuters, he thought prisoners would work harder if they were promised a trip to the brothel at the end of the day. At the Auschwitz brothel, 21 women worked at the same time. Some, it was believed, volunteered, while others were escorted there only to realize where they were when their first client was shown in. The women who have spoken about their time working in a Nazi brothel described how they were forced to see as many as 10 men in a span of two hours. Some of the men, they said, just wanted to talk to a friendly person. On January 27, 1945, the 60th Army of the First Ukrainian Front became the first Allied troops to enter Auschwitz, and the Auschwitz Birkenau Memorial Museum says that around 7,000 prisoners were waiting for them. First thing we noticed is the target was not aimed at us. They were free, but thousands of others were still in hell. The Nazis knew the Soviet Army was coming, so they tried to move around 56,000 prisoners deeper into German territory, where they could still use them as forced laborers. 
We know what happened, but according to the New York Times, there was so much chaos and confusion that this is one of the least documented aspects of the Holocaust. We do know that only those thoughts strong enough to survive were taken. Still, it's estimated that around 15,000 people died during the death marches from Auschwitz alone. Some were shot as they passed through villages. After the death march had passed, the dead were collected and given a proper burial. Memorials marked the places where groups were executed, but for many others, nothing remains. When Vitold Pilecki escaped and told the outside world what horrors were happening to Auschwitz, he begged the Allies to bomb the camp and put an end to the Nazi genocide. But Auschwitz was never bombed. Why? It's complicated. According to The Guardian, Pilecki wasn't alone. Representatives of the Jewish community also petitioned the U.S. War Department, asking them to bomb the camp. But the U.S. declined. They claimed it would require precision bombing that was beyond their capabilities, and that the camp was well beyond the reach of their bombers. They said their air forces were needed elsewhere, and that the mission posed too much of a danger to American troops. Isn't this a thing for our Soviet allies, anyway? Being much closer to the intended target than us, I mean. According to the Jewish Virtual Library, however, there was another reason, the inevitability of civilian casualties. The question came up again and again, and in 1944, the answer was still no. But what about those who were in the camp? The United States Holocaust Memorial Museum says that some survivors recalled hearing nearby bombs and remembered the hope it gave them, saying, We were no longer afraid of death. At any rate, not of that death. Every bomb that exploded filled us with joy. 